Welcome everyone to the Stateless Atheist. Today I'm going to be responding to a video from John McWhorter from Columbia University. It seems he was doing this within a debate. And I want to start by saying I'm not trying to silence black conservative views or views of black people that are the opposite of the mainstream. But just like he thinks the mainstream black community or anti-racist community, as he'll talk about in the video, needs to be challenged when they say something wrong. He, as well, needs to be challenged when he says something wrong. So, let's begin. We discuss racism in America and whether it exists and to what extent and how important it is. The first thing on a lot of our minds is racism from the police. And so I think we need to talk about that first. And there's some things that I don't think we always know. Tamir Rice was a black boy of about 12 who was brandishing a toy weapon and he was shot dead. The exact same thing happened to a boy named Daniel Shaver not long after that. Daniel Shaver was white. For starters, if you're going to complain that people don't know about these things, at least give the correct information. Dan Tamir Rice was a 13-year-old boy. Daniel Shaver was in his 20s. So he wasn't a boy anymore. Two completely different things right then and there. Yes. Daniel Shaver was killed. A lot of people know about Daniel Shaver now. Yes, they didn't know about it then. Why? If you actually look into the case, his video was actually hidden. His um, body cam uh, footage video was hidden until after the case was over. But once the case, the video was released, a lot of people know about Daniel Shaver. Even a recent Black Lives Movement Protest even highlighted Daniel, uh, the case against Daniel, uh, the cop who killed Daniel Shaver, and brought it back into the spotlight. So, try. Let's talk uh, oranges with oranges. Don't try to throw an apple in there. Sam Dubose was shot dead by the police driving his car away from a cop. The exact same thing happened. Actually, a little bit before that, to a white guy named Andrew Thomas. Alton Sterling was a black man who reached into his waistband and reached for his wallet during an altercation with the cops. And the cops shot him dead. That was a grievous event. And the same thing actually happened around the same time to a white guy named Dylan Noble. Alton Sterling made national headlines. And I'm not sure about Dylan Noble. Sure. If I looked into this quickly. Actually, if you look into the case, Dylan Noble did make national news when it happened. People didn't hear of him. They didn't read. But it made national news. So th these are completely different things. Maybe we should look into why people aren't paying attention to it. That's different than it not making national news. Zimmerman said some really nasty things about unspecified little people and how they're always going around stealing things before he ended up killing Trayvon Martin. Now, that was a terrible thing, especially because a policeman said the same sorts of things, including using the word fucker, before he killed a white teenager named Lauren Simpson. I could do this for 20 minutes. Well, I don't think there should be any distinction between killing for a racist reason or reverse murder in general, but there is a distinction. I I'm talking about when it comes to um, the penalties, not when it comes to figuring out how to solve the issue. That's completely different. So fucker is not equal to racist slurs that George Zimmerman was saying. So let's, again, let's talk oranges with orange juice. 
not oranges and apples. There is a very understandable tendency in the media to report stories of black people unjustly killed by the police. Whereas what we don't know is that for every one of those events, there is a white teenager or 20-something who was killed under almost ominously similar conditions where you really got to dig to find it out. Now, I'm not saying that there's fake news or some grand conspiracy. I understand why the media are so concerned with the black cases. But I'm bringing this up. But you don't tell us why you think they bring it up? Do you have a motive for not telling us? I'm not going to say you do have a motive, but I, I think I know why you did. I'm not going to tell you why, like you're not going to tell us why you you think they bring it up. But as I already pointed out with uh, Dylan, I quickly found that his news was, uh, his article um, incident was in the news. There's other white cases that are in the news that I bet you we could find also. And I bet you there's a lot of black cases that we could find that never make national news. Maybe someone should do a study on why certain cases make national news and others don't. That would be an interesting study. But you're kind of making like backhanded claims here with nothing to justify it. Because I think that generally we are often told that any conversation about race is shut down by the purported racist tendencies of cops who, in a hair trigger situation, will allow their quiet bias to kill a black guy when if it were a white guy, he would get away with a slap on the hand. That's a very reasonable assumption. But you know, it's not just, the, it's not that the individual police have to be racist. Yes, I understand you're going to go into uh, racist inst institutions in a minute, but it's, it's much deeper than just an individual being racist. It's the whole system which acts against the black community. What's really hasn't held up to scrutiny. It's why I allowed myself to do this particular debate with this particular question. Even the numbers are quite different from what we hear. And so, for example, there is the issue of proportion. So, white men, 62% of the male population, they are half of the people who get killed by cops. Black men, 13%, and they are a quarter of the people who are killed by cops. And so it's disproportionate. So one might think, well, that means that still there is a racist bias against black men because so many more of them are killed proportionately. But no, not... Okay, yes, both of those statistics are true. More men are killed by cops than women, and more blacks are killed proportionately by cops than white. But we, we have to look at it. There, there, there's two different things. There's a nature, and then there's a sociological. Is violence natural? for the groups we're talking about, or is it something that's sociologically in, um, inputted, let's say, on that group? I'm not going to say there's conclusive evidence, but there is some evidence that men might naturally be more violent than women. It could also be sociological. There's a good case of it. And if it's not, then, and if it is more sociological, then we need to bring that up more, not forget not say, well, this is a good reason to forget the, the cases of the black community. But there is no evidence that black people are naturally more violent to cause the incidences with the police. There's some good evidence that sociologically that's created. But let's continue. Really, there's a debating trick that's going on in relation to that. Because wasn't so long ago that when we talked about welfare, disproportionate amount of black people were on welfare, but more white people were on welfare numerically. So if anybody pointed out that a disproportionate number of black people were 
on welfare, it was always pointed out by a certain crowd that no, actually, many more white people were on welfare, and that was considered a smackdown comment. Well, it depends on how the statistic is used. Like, there are many white people that will say that, oh, whites don't really use welfare. Then it would be valid to say, no, 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 more whites use it than blacks. That is a knockdown comment. Like, it, it, it depends on how they're using the, the statistic. It's not just a could always be used or not. Like, you have to be more specific on how the original statistic was used to know whether or not it's a knockdown. Oh, we're in the same sort of situation, or it was often said, if you kept asking questions, the reason there's a disproportionate number of black people on welfare is because poverty affects black people disproportionately because of structural racism. That was reasonable. Well, we also know that poverty makes it more likely for somebody to encounter a policeman in these sorts of situations. Poverty caused by structural racism, therefore, might certainly make it so that there are more black men killed by the police. And that means we have to question the idea that what this is all about is underlying pernicious biases of the cops. Okay, we should stop right there. You just answered your own question. Why are you continuing? I almost can't believe I'm saying this because I spent a very long time thinking what a lot of people think about the cops. I had a reputation for saying that racism is as important as people make it, but I always made an exception for the cops. And not too long ago, I had one of my blogging heads conversations with Glenn Lowry, where I told him, Glenn, you've got to give me figures, if that's not true. And I didn't know that the figures actually exist. And so I had to really make an adjustment, really think in a new way about this kind of thing. What we're told about the cops simply isn't true. Therefore, when I say that anti-racism is as much a problem as a help at this point, I'm saying that after my conversion about the cops, the cops are not a smackdown issue in this, in this debate. So, with that said, what's the issue here? Why in the world would I say that anti-racism is a problem? Because, of course, no, it's not a problem to not be a racist. And I don't think any of us would be here if we thought the debate was over that. I totally agree. Okay, we're done. So, of course, you don't want to be a racist. Racism is bad. We know that. But what about the more complex and therefore more interesting issues? And one issue is that anti-racism is currently configured, has gone a long way from what used to be considered intelligent and sincere civil rights activism. Today, it's a religion. And I don't mean that as a rhetorical feint. I mean it actually is what any naive anthropologist would recognize as a Let's use a couple of definitions of religion. Let's see how close. The belief in and worship of a superhuman controlling power. No, nothing there about that. A particular system of faith and worship. I don't know if there's any worship going on. I, I, I don't think there is in uh, anti-racist circles. A pursuit or interest to which someone ascribes supreme importance. Oh, interest to which someone ascribes supreme importance. Yeah. It fits that definition, but that's more of a, like he was saying, a rhetorical version of religion. But let's go to the anthropological definition. At one time, anthropologists believed that certain religious practices and beliefs were more or less universal to all cultures at some point in their development, such as belief in spirits or ghosts. The use of magic as a means of controlling the supernatural. The use of deviation. Here's the definition from an anthropological standpoint. A system of symbols which acts to establish powerful, persuasive, and long-lasting moods and motivations in men by formulating conceptions of a gender, general order of existence, and clothing that these conceptions with such an aura of factuality that the moods and motivations seem uniquely realistic. Today, religious anthropologists debate and reject the cross-cultural validity of these categories, often viewing them as European primitivism. Anthropologists have considered various criteria for, for defining religion, such as belief in the supernatural or the reliance on ritual. But few of them claim these criteria are universally valid. Anthony S.C. Wallace proposes four categories of religion, each subsequent category subsuming the previous. 
These are, however, synthetic categories that do not necessarily encompass all religions. Individualistic, most basic, simplest example, vision quest. Shamanistic, communal, ecclesiastical. None, none of the definitions fit anti-racism from an anthropological standpoint, or even from or a more um, mundane or um, vernacular standpoint. So, where are you getting this from? Faith in people, many of whom don't think of themselves as religious, but Galileo would recognize them quite easily. And so, for example, the idea that the responsible white person is supposed to attest to their white privilege and realize that it can never go away and feel eternally guilty about it, that... Okay. Yes, there are some people that use white privilege as an insult and things like that. That I disagree with that 100%. It doesn't mean white privilege doesn't exist. Anybody who goes out and goes, oh, you're just a privileged white person, uh, you shut up. They're just as wrong as the person who says, no, 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 we shouldn't even be talking about white privilege. White privilege is about the fact that my, while my life might suck, my race, my skin color has not been the one of the contributing factors towards why my Life sucks. Original sin, right there. The idea that there is going to be a day when America comes to terms with race, or that there could be. What does that even mean? What is the meaning of the coming to terms? What would that consist of? Who would come to them? What would the terms be? At what date would this be? The only reason that anybody says that is because it corresponds to our conception of Judgment Day. And... Or it could be that we need to move beyond race. That could be the reason why. I'm not, maybe, I'm not 100% sure, but maybe that's the reason. It's equally abstract. When we use the word problematic, especially since about 2008 or nine, what we're really saying is blasphemous. It's really the exact same term. Or the suspension of disbelief that is a characteristic of religious faith. There's an extent to which logic is considered no longer to apply. That's how we talk about racism. And so suppose someone asks, why are we to focus? I, I don't know. I was actually been using logic throughout this whole conversation. So are there people that are anti-racist that throw logic out the window? Yeah, probably. There are racists that throw logic out the window. So I don't know how it's the anti-racist movement is throwing logic out the window. Like I don't, I don't understand that. On the occasional rogue cop who kills a black man, when nine times out of ten that black man is in much more danger of being killed by another black man in his neighborhood. Gosh, that's not pretty. But like many things that aren't pretty, it's also true. Okay, so now there's three problems that you're completely missing. Number one, that's true of any race. A white person is more likely to be killed by a white person. A Spanish person is more likely to be killed by a Spanish person. An Asian is more likely to be killed by an Asian. At such high proportions, it's like 80%, 90%. Probably each race is a little different. But the reason why is because that's usually the people you're around more often. Those are the people you're family with. Those are the people you're friends with more often. That has nothing to do with being black. Number two, the police is supposed to be there to help them. So if they're there killing them, so if there was a police uh, video that was just uploaded uh, the other week, how a black man called for help. He called the 911 for help to come. And if you watch the whole video, he was a little spaced out and all. And they said, come here, come, come here. And he wasn't listening. But he was never violent in the video or anything like that. What did they do? They, they tasered him and tackled him. He called for help. That's, if the people that you're calling for help are actually killing you, that's a problem. That's a bigger problem than the people you don't expect to help you killing you.
Number three, you, you talked about structural racism, how it puts you more in conflict with the police. It also puts you more in conflict with each other. Think about it. If structural poverty brings, it almost brings people in that area, almost into a Hobbesian world of all against all. If there's only, let's do a thought experiment. If there's only one apple tree and there's a hundred people and there's no other food to eat, don't you think the people are going to fight over it? As opposed to if there's a hundred apple trees and a hundred people. So the less resources they have, the more conflict they cause. So within sociological research, um, there's a thing called path dependence also. So if you, if what happens in the past cuts certain paths off to an individual, certain institutions, uh, certain um, things going forward. Like, use an example. If someone's parent went to prison, they are more likely to get a, um, a suboptimal education than if their parent didn't go. The black community, more of the parents, more of the men, go to prison. So this, of course, will cause the education system for the next generation to be worse. So what do they do? They come up and now they're cut off from the job market, sometimes from zoning laws, uh, minimum wage laws, all these different laws that keep businesses out of their communities. They have to resort to crimes like uh, dealing drugs, prostitution, things like that to make a living. Then the police come and have to feel like they have to arrest them for these things when these are their only means of survival. Then of course, yes, if this is my only means of survival and you're going to come to arrest me, that's self-defense when I'm fighting back from you. So now I'm also going to have a gun. So that increases the conflict between the police. So it's much deeper than just, oh, well, uh, black people kill black people. No, you have to dig deeper than that. It's a lot more complicated. If you ask about it, well, you know, you're not supposed to. I rule, and you're given an answer that doesn't really completely make sense. The answer I just gave you completely makes sense, and it's backed up by a lot of facts. There's an etiquette that you're supposed to stop there. It's rather like certain questions that you ask a priest very gently, but you know that if you don't get a real answer, then you're just supposed to move on. That we're used to with being devoutly religious, that's the way racism is treated in the It's a religion. And many of us might say, you know, after thinking about it, you might realize that even if you're somebody who looks on devout religious faith among, say, a Mormon or a fundamentalist as something peculiar, you read books by anthropologists exploring this frame of mind, even if you realize, it might even be pleasant to realize about yourself that you are religious just like them. If you wonder how Mormon feels, to be an anti-racist today is to be ideologically a very, very similar person. You might own it. I'm 100% against religion. I don't think religion should exist. I'm not religious in any form. And I'm quite anti-racist, so... Where are we going? You might say, what's wrong with this? What's wrong with this religion? It's certainly a better religion than any others I can think of. But there are problems with it. There are severe problems with it. It does some good things. It gets some good people elected. I agree. Well, I don't agree that good people are elected. I agree that's a problem, but not for the same reason you think it is. Actually, you, you said it's not a problem. It's a good thing. I think anti-racist crowd needs to look at the... We need more community-driven problem-solving. Yes, right now with the government, politics needs to be involved a little bit because we need to get government out of it. And the only way to do that right now is through some type of political action. 
I don't think I have the answer, but I think people should rely more on their communities than the government. Certainly. It does some good things, but it does some bad things. And so, for example, if you're a good anti-racist, then you're thinking about the cops that kill black men in these scenes that we know about. But you're not supposed to think about the fact that so much more murder happens to men like that in their own neighborhoods. You're supposed to think of that as maybe connected to racism in some abstract way. Not very abstract at all. The drug war. That automatically creates violence. It's, that's a fact. Um, poverty creates violence. That's a fact. So it's not that abstract to think that murder happens because of these reasons. But you're not supposed to think about it. You're not supposed to think about all of those homicides. Every summer in big cities across America, teenage black boys are killing one another in the hundreds over frankly nothing. That's somehow less important than what the occasional rogue cop does. I already explained the three reasons why. Yeah, it is more important. That's modern anti-racism for you. That's backwards. Another example, education. To be an anti-racist is to pay attention to the idea that universities must foster diversity. The idea being supposedly universities wouldn't want to foster this diversity if they weren't made to do so. Now, what? Yeah, I kind of agree with this. Uh, I, I, I don't agree with affirmative action programs. Uh, I don't remember, I read it a few years ago, there was a, um, a school, I forget, I think it might have been in Texas, that actually, what they did was they took the people who were the top 10% of any schools, even the worst schools, because think about it. If you're in a terrible school, but you're still able to get to the top 10%, you worked hard in that school. But I wish we would open up things more like school choice, more uh, home-based uh, education. Stop locking up the parents. That, like I said, helps increase the education of the children. What that means is that often this diversity is fostered as the result of creating a different evaluation system for black and often Latino students in terms of grades and test scores. Now, there are various studies that show that that often is not the best thing. And so Stephen Cole and Eleanor Barber did a paper where contrary to their expectations, it showed that when students are mismatched to a university, discourages them from getting PhDs. There have been many. I don't know if getting PhDs should be the goal. Maybe it should be just being successful. Maybe they didn't want to get PhDs. There should be a much broader reason for education than just getting a PhD. Studies of that kind, but we're told to look away from them. So after racial preferences were banned in the University of California, before they were banned at the University of California, San Diego, in a freshman class of 3,268 students, of the freshman honor students, exactly one was black. In 1999, this is the first class admitted after the ban, when students were matched to a school according to their grades and test scores, rather than there being the kind of bonus that we see. We're now seeing it at Harvard. One out of five black freshmen were making honors. Why have you never heard of that system? Why don't we worry more about black people trying to be able to get to the better schools than just getting the honors? And again, school choice, a lot of the structural racism behind the scenes. Yes, information like that needs to be out there and people should understand it. But that's not just a knockdown like, oh, oh yeah. They, they did honors. What if it was just a school that's just handing out grades? I'm not saying it is. But that's not necessarily just the end-all goal. We need a much more broad approach to helping the black community. It's actually a beautiful story. These are black students who did very well, who wouldn't have done as well at Berkeley or UCLA. There's no tragedy. Those students are now out working and living Wonderful lives. Anti-racism teaches us not to. How come 
when you were talking before, the goal was getting a PhD on that first goal uh, study. And now you switched up the, now the goal is just they're out there working. Why do you move? It, it almost seems like you moved the goalpost. Listen to stories like those. And when, when we, we think, think about, about anti-racism, we're taught to suppose. We start to not even think about this anymore. That, that whites need, need to undergo some sort of massive psychological revolution before we can have any kind of black success beyond what we have. I don't know if it's any psychological revolution, but yes, if people have racist tendencies, they have to get rid of the racist tendencies. I don't think that's a big thing to believe. Now, within our system where the majority is controlled by the whites, the whites control the power. Yes, that matters in a great deal. Now, if we moved more towards a community-based system where the power is withheld in the communities, that would matter much less. It would still matter, but much less. So let's move towards that. And at the same time, let's reduce people's racist tendencies and views. Right. Why? Why is somebody talking about their white privilege important when we're talking about making black schools better? Why is it important for a Black Lives Matter activist? Because right now, the whites control the power. If, if you have racists within the school board, they're not going to allow black schools to be better. Yes. I don't even think it has to be inherently racist because like, there could be people that are racist and they don't even realize they are. And that's, that's possible too. Pro Hillary Clinton's heart as opposed to thinking about what policy she will take in terms of criminal sentencing or housing policy or the on the ground sorts of things. Because racist policies or institutions don't have to be inherently racist. If they overwhelmingly affect a certain race, then they're racist. Like, it doesn't matter if their original intent was for racist reasons. Like, with COVID-19 going on right now, more blacks are being affected by it than whites. That is a racist policy because of that reason. It's disproportionately hurting the black community. And that needs to be paid attention to, not just the policy that somebody wants to do, because the policy might result in the negative outcomes. We really need to be thinking about if we want to help black people. I can go on here too. There are a lot of things wrong with anti-racism. There's some good things, but there are just as many that are wrong that hold us back so far, your three reasons weren't that good a reason, so I don't know if where you're coming up with these. Let's hear, if those are your three best reasons, which usually in a debate, that's what you want to throw out. Your best reasons, not your worst. I don't think the rest of your reasons are any better. From helping black people who need help, because we're taught to think of certain things rather than other things. In particular, we're taught to think less about the real work of helping people who need help on the ground through socio-political action. And instead, we end up thinking about inner psychology, we end up thinking about that which is problematic, and all these things are ultimately idle. So, this is what I mean by saying that anti-racism is a problem. Anti-racism is currently configured, not anti-racism just in itself, but modern anti-racism turns a blind eye to the most Black homicide. Anti-racism as currently configured turns a blind eye to black young people's upward mobility. It turns a blind eye to doing the kinds of things that civil rights leaders of 50 years ago considered ordinary in favor of what is ultimately an inwardly focused quest for moral absolution that has at best a diagonal relationship to helping people who've been left behind. For that reason, 
The issue here are must not whether or not racism exists. We know it does. Read the paper this morning, had some racism of my own two weeks ago. That's not the issue. The issue is whether modern anti-racism is the best way of combating the effects of that racism. And it isn't. I think instead of going against modern anti-racism, let's try to move the needle forward, which again, in your conversation, you really didn't make any good points, as I pointed out. So let's point out the small areas like, yes, I agree more community, sociopolitical uh, on the ground help needs to be done instead of um, from the government. That's more important. But I don't think any of your other reasons were good. So thank you, everyone, for listening. I hope to see you again soon. Thank you, everyone, for joining me. Please like and subscribe. I'll see you soon.